Did the ancient Israelites practice debt forgiveness? In the Hebrew Bible, there are two passages in the Torah concerning debt forgiveness. Deuteronomy 15 describes the Sabbath year, which occurs every seven years. Any debts accrued by a fellow Israelite were to be forgiven. The passage also strongly warns against trying to cheat the system by not lending to the poor when it got close to the seventh year. Concern for the poor and needy is repeatedly emphasised. In addition, if any Israelite had a Hebrew slave, they were to release them unless the slave volunteered to stay. Similarly, in Leviticus 25, we get the year of Jubilee, which was to occur every 50th year. The passage explains that every seven years the land was to have rest, no harvest, and there was also to be a property buyback scheme for those who sold land out of poverty. If they couldn't come up with the means to buy it back, then the property was returned to them in the year of Jubilee. Debt slaves were also to be released every 50th year. It's important to note that these biblical ordinances only extended debt forgiveness to one's fellow countrymen. Israelites could lend with interest to foreigners as well as take foreign slaves, but the ideal was that there would be no poor among the Israelites. So here's the question. Were these biblical precepts really practiced in the ancient world, or were they just a utopian pipe dream? To begin with, let's look at debt forgiveness in the ancient world. We actually have several examples of debt forgiveness being practiced in the ancient Near East. The so-called Laws of Hammurabi contain a precept that required the release of an Akkadian slave after three years. Hammurabi's successor, Amisa Duka, issued a decree releasing workers from their debts and cancelling interest-bearing personal loans for his subjects. Commercial loans were excluded. Finally, one of the most famous examples is from the Rosetta Stone. The inscription contains a proclamation of debt cancellation by Pharaoh Ptolemy V, made in 196 BCE. So why did ancient rulers forgive debts? Well, scholars suspect that far from reflecting the generosity of the king, there were politically advantageous reasons to forgive debts. First, ancient militaries were typically made up of land-owning freemen. If too many people were in debt slavery, this could create a military problem. Secondly, monarchs wanting to maintain their power may not have wanted wealthy creditors to take control of all the land. This could be countered by issuing a decree. Finally, too much debt slavery could have a detrimental impact on ancient societies and the economy, and it made one's country vulnerable. However, there's something different about the biblical precepts. In these ancient decrees, the monarch would forgive debts when it was advantageous to them. Whereas in the Torah, it occurred on a 7 and 50 year cycle. So was it ever practiced? While there's only limited evidence, the Bible does record two narratives which feature debt forgiveness. In Jeremiah 34, Israel's enemies are attacking Jerusalem. In response, the prophet Jeremiah tells King Zedekiah to enact the Sabbath year and free the debt slaves. Initially, the officials do this, but after the crisis, they took back their slaves. Jeremiah then lambasted the people for ignoring the seventh year of debt forgiveness, proclaiming judgment on them. The second time debt forgiveness is enacted in the Hebrew Bible, things go a little better. In Nehemiah 5, the people of Israel complained to Nehemiah about their harsh conditions, saying, we have had to mortgage our fields and our homes to survive the famine. Our children are subject to slavery. Nehemiah talks to the nobles and the officials and demands that they cancel debts and return the land to the people, including any interest. And they agree without complaint. The story seems to suggest cyclical debt forgiveness was not already being practiced. Now, it's difficult to know if the passages in Jeremiah and Nehemiah reflect any historical reality around debt forgiveness or are simply there to serve the narrative. And it's not discussed anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible. We don't have any evidence that Jubilee or the Sabbath year were practiced regularly or part of any national legal code, 
but there is some evidence to suggest that the Sabbath year was adopted by some groups. In the first century BCE, there was a rabbi named Hillel the Elder, who coincidentally was the grandfather of Gamaliel, a rabbi who, according to the Book of Acts, instructed the Apostle Paul. Hillel the Elder was apparently aware that some were adhering to debt forgiveness in the Sabbath year, and this was supposedly creating some problems, whereby people were reluctant to lend money. Hillel developed a legal loophole known as prosbol, which allowed debts to be transferred to a court. When the debt was owed to the court and not an individual, it survived the seventh year of debt forgiveness. Creation of such a loophole seems to indicate that prior to this, at least some Jews were practicing the Sabbath year in accordance with the Torah. We also know from Josephus and the Book of Maccabees that people were keeping track of the Sabbath year and allegedly not harvesting their fields in accordance with Deuteronomy. However, some scholars are skeptical as to the reliability of these accounts. Regardless of whether Jubilee or the Sabbath year was practiced, at the turn of the millennia, the idea of debt forgiveness took on a new, more spiritual meaning. Debt forgiveness passages are discussed in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, numbered 11Q13, dating to the first century BCE. In this apocalyptic text, the author explicitly interprets debt forgiveness in Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 15 to mean that on the Day of Atonement, the Sons of Light would have their sins forgiven. Thus, it shouldn't surprise us when in the following century, another apocalyptic preacher, Jesus of Nazareth, also uses the metaphor of debt forgiveness in regards to the forgiveness of sins. For example, in the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6 reads, Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Similarly, Matthew 18 records a parable by Jesus about a master who forgives one of his servants' debt. The servant then ruthlessly collected money that was owed to him. The king then punished the servant for his hypocrisy. Jesus taught that the master's forgiveness of debt was akin to God's forgiveness and that his followers in turn should forgive others. So what can we say about debt forgiveness in the Bible? It was not a unique phenomenon to the ancient Israelites. However, unlike other ancient debt forgiveness edicts, the biblical law seems primarily concerned with protecting the liberty of the poor and needy among one's fellow countrymen, and it was not subject to the timing and whims of a king. We can't be sure though how widely it was practiced, if at all, but there is some limited evidence to suggest that it was practiced by some Jews at least into the first century BCE. The idea of debt forgiveness in apocalyptic preaching came to represent God's forgiveness of his followers' sins. So there you have it, that's debt forgiveness in the Bible and the ancient world. My name's Lachlan, you've been watching Bible Unboxed, links to support the channel in the description, and I will see you in the next one. Commandment number 11, share and comment below.